States government has detected and is tracking a high altitude surveillance balloon that is over the continental United States right now. The U.S. government, to include NORAD, continues to track and monitor it closely. The balloon is currently traveling at an altitude well above commercial air traffic and does not present a military or physical threat to people on the ground. Instances of this kind of balloon activity have been observed previously over the past several years. Once the balloon was detected, the U.S. government acted immediately to protect against the collection of sensitive information. Welcome to High Cheese. It's Friday, February 3rd, 2023. It's, it appears that we're going out of our way to make ourselves look weak in the face of China and face of the world. We've got a balloon sent from China, and we know what it is. It's a surveillance balloon. Right now, it's uh, over a military base in Montana. And let me remind you, it's a nuclear military base, and this is where we shoot our nuclear weapons in order to f- defend our country in the case of a nuclear war. And we've got a Chinese balloon over it. And we didn't shoot it down. And the excuse was, oh, well, we don't want it to fall on people who could fall and hurt t- people. Now, let me just give you the size of the balloon. Apparently, the size of the balloon is like three, the equivalent of three uh, school buses. And I guess some, there's some equipment attached to it. But... They're afraid of shooting it down and it falling on people. It's a balloon. And Montana is one of the least densely populated states in the union. So this is a really, really weak, weak argument that they're making. And the Chinese are interpreting this as weakness. Heck, I'm interpreting this as weakness. Just shoot it down. You know, shoot it down, tell everybody, do it, send an emergency message to everybody in Montana, say, hey, keep heads up. There could be a falling balloon, but we can't shoot it down. And they did a, uh, there was an interview earlier today, and it was uh, with Representative Zinke from Montana. And he had the best suggestion. And here's his suggestion. This is what we should do to this balloon. And this is what you get when you're overly bureaucratized. It's called paralysis through analysis. Oh, you know, if we shoot it down, you know, maybe they'll, you know, they'll discover our technique and how to shoot down a balloon. Well, what should, should be so secret about shooting down a balloon that we should prevent the Chinese from having? Or maybe there's something dangerous. What could be do- so dangerous in the balloon? Maybe it's nuclear or something. No, we would know if it's nuclear. Now, one thing I want to know is how how come it took so long for them to pick up the fact that it's in Montana? I want to know when did we pick it up in our defense system, and we should know. Now, you know, maybe the defense department doesn't want China to know when we picked it up on our radar. If we have to hide when we picked it up on our radar, we got a problem with our radar system. So, again, I want to know why it took so long for it to go into United States territory and then it not become an issue until it gets into Montana. Now, you know, this whole thing with balloons brings up some interesting ideas. And, and one of the things that I find interesting is that the more and more we get high tech in our military, the more and more low tech items become important. And a really good example is these drones that are being used by Russia in the uh, Ukrainian war, you know, you, uh, these, these drones are really yo- low tech, s- slower moving. And you have to understand is that these um, defense systems, these high tech defense systems are, are employed to p- protect yourself from other high tech missiles. So they're not necessarily there to protect low tech missiles like drones. And there is a, uh, there is a benefit to that. And balloons are another benefit to that. Now, I was reading a story also is that I think it's China and uh, also Russia. They're also using uh, balloon technology to uh, develop EMP bombs. So what an EMP is, it's an electromagnetic pulse bomb. And essentially, you float it into an enemy's territory. And I'm sure you can do it with a missile. 
but this is low, a low tech version of it. You can float it into an uh, enemy's uh, territory, explode it, and what an EMP does is just fries all your electronics. So essentially, everybody's computer would get fried. Everybody, anything that has a chip would get fried. Electricity would go down. Anything that runs on electronics would just be fried. And I guess the Chinese and the Russians are using balloon technology as a way to deliver EMPs. But, you know, that's here nor there in this case. In this case, we're showing China that we are weak. And think about it. Remember, uh, for those of you who don't remember, uh, the U-2, Russia shot down U-2 with Gary Powers. We had a U-2 plane is a... Um, data gathering plane that we used in the 60s i think we still use it today and we had sent one over russia and russia shot it down and took the pilot as a hostage and this was in the 60s i think it was early 60s so why couldn't we just do that with a a poor balloon now i'm sure there's going to be more on this i mean there was a report also that uh, uh biden had said he wanted to shoot it down, and the military overruled them. And two things, that would not have happened under a Trump administration. Trump, a, Trump would have shot it down or gave the order to shoot it down. If anyone in the military had said no, they would have been asked to resign right then and there. And that's the difference between strength and leadership that we need today versus weakness, is what, and which is what we're getting out of the United States. So the Chinese are saying, well, this is just a weather balloon. It's nothing more than just a weather balloon that uh, got out of hand. It caught the wrong winds. And it wound up over a military base in Montana. And no one believes that. And our response is that uh, Secretary of State Blinken, who had scheduled a meeting with the Chinese, had canceled the meeting. Instead of just shooting it down, and having the meeting and the discussing it at the meeting, they let the balloon go and canceled the meeting. What does that get you? What kind of sign of strength is that? So we shall see. Now, we're headed for a two-front kinetic war within the next few years. Unless things change. But we're headed for a kinetic war with China over Taiwan, and we'll have a second front in against Russia in Ukraine. Now, let me just give you a little update on Ukraine. Now, apparently there's a report that Russia has placed or is in the process of placing one half a million troops on the border of Ukraine right now for, I guess, an offensive in the spring. Half a million, that's 500,000 troops that he's putting in place on the border right now for a spring offensive. Now, let's just put that in perspective. Uh, initially, with 100, I think 160, 170,000 troops, Russia was able to annex 20% of Ukraine. So imagine what they're going to do with a half a million troops. And as I've always said, Russia is just going to grind Ukraine down. Now, the, the Ukraine started the war. They had 200,000 soldiers, active military. They've lost 100,000. They're down to 100,000 active military. I'm sure they called up reserves. Who knows where those reserves are? Could be part of the 40,000 civilians that have been killed in the war. So eventually, Russia is just going to grind these uh, soldiers down. And then Zelensky is going to come. Ah, we need help. We need your help. We need your troops on the ground. Now, apparently, 101st Airborne Division is in, I think they're in Poland right now, one of the eastern NATO countries. And I want to know what they're doing there. Is that just the first step to boots on the ground? So that's where we are. Now, speaking of Ukraine and their corruption right now, a report came out and said that on the day of the war that President Zelensky ordered the destruction of all documents that had to do with uh, 
Metabiota, an American company called Metabiota, that was owned by Hunter Biden and his companies. And what Metabiota did was that uh, they did research on viruses, and they were becoming quite active in Ukraine. So I don't know where this is going, um, but we shall see. I just want to give you a heads up on that. I think I did a story on this oh, maybe f six months ago. So this whole issue with biolabs in Russia, in Ukraine, is raising its he uh, head again. So we shall see on that. So the Republicans have started two of many hearings to come on the Biden administration. And the first hearing is coming from the Judiciary Committee and is looking into the country's implementation of its border policy. So let me just go to a clip by Jim Jordan, which will put everything into perspective for us. The Biden administration does not have operational control of the border. Month after month after month, we have set records for migrants coming into the country. And frankly, I think it's intentional. I don't know how anyone with common sense or logic can reach any other conclusion. I, it seems deliberate. It seems premeditated. It seems intentional. And as if that's not bad enough, we now learn that the crisis is no longer just confined to the southwest border. Last week, the chief border patrol agent in Vermont tweeted this, quote, in less than four months, Swanton sector's apprehensions have surpassed the combined two prior years. Just in the past four months, more than the two years combined beforehand. Make no mistake, the Biden administration is carrying out its plan. We all heard Secretary Mayorkas sat in front of this committee and said, we are executing our plan on the border. And we all heard President Biden say, we're trying to make it easier for people to get here. Well, they're certainly succeeding in that. Imagine the frustration that our border communities feel when they hear that the damage done to their land and to their businesses the crimes committed by illegal alien trespassers, and the overwhelmed local resources that are all part of their own federal government's plan. Today, we will hear about some of the effects of Biden's open border policies on everyday Americans and the communities in which they live. We will hear about dangerous encounters with illegal migrants on private property. We will hear about the devastating effects, as I said earlier, of fentanyl on American families. And we will hear about Mexican smuggling cartels exploiting the open border to terrorize U.S. communities. And the worst part is that none of this had to happen. Under President Trump, the border was secure. Under President Biden, there is no border. Okay, and this should be the precursor for an impeachment of Mayorkas, who's been orchestrating this mess on the border. And also there's going to be an investigation into the waste and the pandemic spending. And if you can remember, uh, during the pandemic, the uh, federal government uh, threw out massive amounts of money to companies in order for them to keep their employees staffed. And apparently there's billions and billions of dollars that has been wasted and literally stolen. And there will have an investigation on this. And, you know, just a, a refresher on this is that this was all about giving companies money in order to keep them employed. So you were given this loan and it would be forgiven if you did not fire your employees during the pandemic. It keep, kept people employed. It didn't throw people out um, on unemployment. And uh, in a way it worked, but there was a lot of waste in it. So what the oversight committee is doing, it's taking the first step in finding out what went on and how government dropped the ball on this. And also the oversight committees going to start their investigation into uh, Hunter Biden. Now, this is about Joe Biden. You got to remember, this is about Joe Biden. The press is trying to make this all about, oh, they're picking on poor Hunter Biden because he's the president's son. No, they're going after Hunter Biden. Remember this. They're going after Hunter Biden because of the connection, essentially, of he, him being Joe Biden, the president of the United States, bag man. And that's what's going on here. So don't listen to the mainstream media. Here's what they're trying to spin all these um, investigations about. Oh, it's political retribution. They're going after all their political enemies. No, it's about accountability. It's about accountability on the border. And it's ac about ca accountability for the president of the United States and his involvement with running his family like a mafia family. 
So Kevin McCarthy met with uh, Biden this week to discuss the debt ceiling and what proposals the president is going to make in order to avoid a partial government shutdown. And I guess there was some uh, movement ahead on this, but nothing real clear. You won't see any movement on this until months from now, because, again, the projections are that there won't be an issue until June. And, and I want to bring this, you know, this is what's getting me. The press is out there saying, oh, the, the Republicans want to cut Social Security. They want to cut Medicaid. And clearly, McCarthy has come out and said that's off the table. Trump has already come out and said, listen, I am recommending that you do not touch Social Security. You do not touch Medicare. But the press is just ignoring it. They're literally coming out and lying about, oh, this is what the Republicans want. And it's the, again, it's the exact opposite. Now, the other lie that they're saying is that if they don't come to any conclusion, the United States will default on his debt. And that's the farthest from the truth. The only way that the United States will default on its debt is if Janice Yellen, with the approval of Joe Biden, does not pay the debt. Now, this government's got plenty of money coming in. I, said, I think McCarthy in the last press conference he had, he said, you know, we're bringing record amount of money. But we're also spending a record amount of money. So we've got plenty of money coming in. So the only reason that we would default on its debt is if Yellen just says, no, don't pay the debt. So instead of furloughing people, laying people off, holding back on other funds, say to other countries, they just determine that, well, paying the debt is a low priority. So we're not going to pay it. So that's the only reason because there's plenty of money that comes in to the United States coffers that allows them to pay the debt. The only reason they won't pay the debt is if they choose not to. If they'd rather send money overseas to fund another country instead of paying our own debt. So I don't believe that spin by the uh, media. So speaking of Biden, I guess the uh, FBI went into Biden's beach house. Now, I think he's got four or five really big mansions all over the place. I want to know how a guy did that. He's been working in Washington on a government salary for, since 19, the early 1970s or late 1970s. And he's been able to accumulate mansions. Now, look, he made decent money as a center. They, you know, they don't make bad money. They make decent money. But not enough to afford five mansions, I think it is. So he, he's got, uh, one of them is a beach house. And I guess the FBI went in there. It wasn't quite a raid. It wasn't, it wasn't what they did at Mar-a-Lago. They kind of went in, told Biden's lawyers, we're coming. We're coming to look. So apparently they found no classified documents. But here's the hidden story here. What they did take is handwritten notes on some of the documents. And I'm kind of curious to f see what those handwritten notes were. Could they be incriminating evidence of Biden's involvement with Hunter? So... They didn't take them for the sake of just taking them. There had to be some relevance here, and that's what I want to find out what the relevance of these handwritten notes are. Because you also have to understand is that the, 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 uh, the White House staff is not saying if they took any additional documents other than classified documents. The only thing they're saying is, oh, we, they took some handwritten notes. So I want to see what, uh, what comes of this. And, you know, I'm not expecting much. And like I always said, their, their, their decision in Washington over this is going to be the decision that hurts Donald Trump the most. So think of that, about that as this thing plays out. And speaking of Donald Trump, Donald Trump came out about a half hour ago with a statement off of Truth Social. It has to do with China. Earlier in the day, he said, uh, I guess he mentioned that he wanted to shoot the, uh, the balloon down. The Chinese balloon. He wants to shoot that down. And I agree with him. So let's go to a statement that he made, about two minutes long, and it's about China. So let's go to this. Uh, let's go to the uh, uh, clip, and then we'll come back and discuss. It's rarely even mentioned that China has many thousands of spies working in the United States in business, finance, academia, technology, media, and likely even government. Very sadly, as president, I established a special initiative at the Department of Justice tasked with the sole mission of targeting Chinese espionage in the United States. Joe Biden 
terminated that program right away, suggesting that it was somehow racist. According to published reports, this came shortly after 160 faculty members of the University of Pennsylvania, where I went to school, the Wharton School of Finance, home of the now infamous Biden Center, wrote to Merrick Garland and demanded that the Chinese espionage initiative be shut down immediately. Congress needs to dig deep into the financial operations of the University of Pennsylvania, its Chinese donors, the Biden Center, and the Biden family, and figure out what the hell is going on. As president, I took the most dramatic action of any administration to curtail China's ability to conduct espionage in the United States. And when I'm back in the White House, those efforts will be expanded in a very, very big way. Instead of hunting down Republicans, a reformed FBI and Justice Department will be hunting down Chinese spies. We will create new partnerships with businesses and universities to give them the tools to protect themselves from insider threats. We will also impose whatever visa sanctions and travel restrictions are necessary to shut off Chinese access to American secrets in compliance with our demands and in compliance with our laws. The FBI even recently admitted that China operates a secret police force on American soil. How do you like that one? Imposing the iron fist of the Communist Party, the rule, think of this, the Communist Party rule on Chinese nationals in the United States. Just think about that. We will shut that down and we will shut it down cold. Thank you very much. What a great policy proposal. Now, I'm not a fan of Lindsey Graham at all. I don't trust him. Something off about him. You know, but Trump uh, keeps him close. And occasionally, Graham comes out with a gem, a gem of a quote. And he came out with a gem of a quote last week about Donald Trump. He goes, look, Donald Trump, and I'm not, this is not verbatim, but he essentially said, look, Donald Trump, yeah, he's obnoxious, but you do not get the accomplishments of a Donald Trump without his personality. I've always said this same similar thing about Trump. You got to take the good with the bad. Is he obnoxious? Yeah, he's obnoxious sometimes. But he also does really good things. So you've got to weigh everything with Donald Trump. And his accomplishments dramatically outweigh his being obnoxious occasionally. And I want to contrast the Donald Trump with his haters. And one of those haters is Rashida Tlaib, and I just want to play a clip of her meltdown, her meltdown over Elon Omar being taken off the Foreign Affairs Committee. I mean, this is just unhinged. It's almost comical. So Elon Omar, if you remember her, she's the representative from Minnesota that made some anti-Semitic statements. The one that really gets me, though, is remember she made the comment that, oh, 9-11 was a really big thing, and then she uh, equated the United States to Hamas and other terrorist groups. Remember that? Oh, somebody did something on September 11th. That's the one that really gets me. That sh- she should have been taken off at that point, but she was protected by Nancy Pelosi. So Kevin McCarthy comes in and takes her off and she, he needs votes for her. I don't know why he needed votes to get, take her off. I, I, I and quite honestly, I, I didn't research it for you and I just don't know right now, but he didn't need, he didn't need uh, votes to get rid of pencil neck Schiff and, Fen Fen's boyfriend, Swalwell, from the House Intelligence Committee, but he needed it for uh, Omar's removal from the Foreign Affairs Committee. So let's just go to this clip and discuss. These are the people that are in Washington. These are the people that are making decisions. And this is typical of many of the people in Washington. She sounds like a child that, well, let me just play it and then we'll come back and discuss. You are showing who you all are, really. The gentlewoman's time has expired. Omar will not be silenced. The gentlewoman's time has expired. To Omar, the I gentlewoman's am so sorry, time has expired. That our country is failing you today through this chamber. You the, belong the in this committee. The gentlewoman is no longer recognized. Oh my God! What I wanted to say before is that she sounds like a teenage girl that was just told that she was grounded for the week. Now I don't even know if parents ground kids anymore. I'm sure there are some parents that don't even know what the term grounded means. But 
this is the maturity level of the people we have in Washington. Whether they are elected officials, whether they are in our institutions. And I'll take you back to Project Veritas with the director from Pfizer that had an absolute meltdown like a child when he was confronted by Jack O'Keefe. These are the people that are making decisions. They're childlike and they're not serious people. And that's what's got to change. While yesterday was Groundhog Day and Puxatawney Phil saw a shadow, which means there's six more weeks of winter. With that said, I just want to go to a sad story. It has to do with a Canadian groundhog that died before, before making his winter prediction. And let me just uh, read this article. And it says here, and the article is from the Huffington Post. It says, across America, groundhogs traditionally make their weather predictions on February 2nd, but no one could have predicted what happened to one up in Quebec. Sadly, Fred Lamarmont, the Quebecois' cousin to Puxitani Phil, died shortly before he was scheduled to reveal whether the Canadian province would experience six more weeks of winter, according to the Canadian Global News. Roberto Blondin, the organizer of the local Groundhog Day event, had to announce the tragic death to the crowd of spectators. When I went to wake him up, he had no vital signs, Blondin said. He most likely died during hibernation. He suspected that Fred passed away in late fall or early December at age nine, according to CBC News. Despite Fred's demise, the Quebec event went ahead with a plush groundhog as a stand-in. <laughs> Leave it to the Quebecers. They, they know how to get through a problem. Meanwhile, a group of children made the official weather prediction for seeing a prolonged winter. One of the groundhog's sons, Fred Jr., will take his dad's spot next year. So poor Fred. I hope his son lives a longer life. Okay, let's go to my loser of the week. And my loser of the week for the week ending February 3rd, 2023 is bum ba Steph Curry. And Steph Curry is my loser of the week for opposing multifamily dwellings from being built near his home. And let me just go to an article in the New York Post. It says here, Steph Curry shows real American divide is wealth, not race. Not every scam presents itself as an immediate monetary reward. Sometimes it's a method to deceptively sway public perception to help protect assets and reputations. It's a low investment, high reward public relations scheme perpetuated by the wealthiest Americans like NBA player Steph Curry to swindle the public into gaining constant favorability. It's called social justice aristocratic activism. Recently, Steph Curry and his wife, Alicia, who have campaigned for President Biden and Black Lives Matter, opposed the development of multifamily housing in Atherton, California, which was ranked first as the priciest zip code last year. The Curry sent a letter to the town stating, we hesitate to add to the not in our backyard, literally, rhetoric. But we wanted to send a note before today's meeting. Safety and privacy for us and our kids continue to be our top priority and one of the biggest reasons we chose Atherton as home. We kindly ask that the town adopts the new housing element without the inclusion of 23 Oakwood. Should that not be sufficient for the state? We ask that the town commits to investing in considerably taller fencing and landscaping to block sight lines onto our family's property. America's aristocrat activists understand that modern activism requires mostly lip service for a noble cause that you can claim you can care about as long as you toss some tax write-off pennies toward a nonprofit organization. Steph Curry and many of his economic ilk have scammed the public into believing that their public persona as the righteous warrior for equality is the same as their private persona. They are willing to bloviate in the media about their fight for the advancement of the common man, but will do everything possible to not live near us. Social justice aristocrats want you to believe that the only inequality that matters is based on immutable characteristics like skin color to distract you 
from questioning the inequality and wealth that exists within our country. You're supposed to be vigilant about the ratio of superficial diversity in your surroundings, but take no interest in class diversity and its impact on society. So Curry is a phony, just like most of them. I want to get into these nonprofit organizations that a lot of these athletes uh, start. And they're nothing more than scams also. And I want to get into that as a later episode. But for this week, Steph Curry gets my loser of the week. Okay, thank you so much for listening. You have a good week, and I will talk to you next Saturday.